As I mentioned earlier, today's a special day because we get to talk about our mission. And the word that came to mind with me was one that Lois Heff said recently, inspiration. I loved that word. Um, I'm inspired when I look around this sanctuary, East Nassau, and online, and I see everyone. And as the song said, what everyone does with our own two hands, um, our own two hands, what we do, um, mind, body, and spirit here at the church um, and in Northeast Florida and beyond. So today, um, to start off our Mission Sunday, um, fresh off of their tour with stops in Palatka, Green Cove Springs, McClenney, and Callahan, we have the UUCJ acting troupe that's going to do a presentation for us. So Lois and Karen, come on up. <laughs> Don't get too excited, <laughs> right? <laughs> Is this right? Okay, I missed the labor of love day for the first time in many years. I was always tired, but it was fun. Working together toward a common goal really cements my connection with this community. Over the years, this connection has become an essential part of my life. I grew up on a farm near a very small town in Minnesota, attending a Methodist church. I remained a Methodist through the marriages of two of my children, then I drifted for a while. Finding UUCJ happened because of two dear family members who are no longer with us. First, my brother, who said to me one year on the annual Minnesota vis visit, you may be a Unitarian and don't know it. <laughs> and we've heard that before. Uh, then I visited. That was sometime in the 90s. I don't remember for sure when. And I knew right away this was the place. Not only the beauty of the campus, but the wording of the principles. This is the way I was trying to live my life. And having been a retailer for many years at that point, I got to practice every day. <laughs> the second person was my young son-in-law who was ill for four years before he died in 20, 2001, leaving my daughter with a 14-year-old and a six-year-old to raise. During those years, I found this pl the place to meditate and to form my understanding of death. I attended more often, and then in 2008, when I sold my shop, I really became a part of this community. Now it is time for the mission funding campaign. This is the time of the year when we make financial plans for next year. For myself, I do not think of this support as part of my charitable giving. I think of this community and this place as an extension of my home. This is about maintaining my home. Thus, the percentage of my means given to UUCJ must be higher than to other charities. So now we must know how you will share your treasure. Our theme this year is Forward Together, Sharing Our Treasure. Sharing together connects us. Just look at what we accomplished in this last year. We made the apartment livable so that our valued techie, Crystal, could move in. What a blessing for her and for us. And after several plumbing incidents, we were able to replace old pipes under the north wing so that we will not be calling the plumbers so regularly. And then your thoughts may be going to all that remodeling that is going downstairs around the social hall. The finances for that project are part of the capital campaign. The mission funding is about our operating expenses. This is the money we need every year to keep the lights and the AC on, to hire our staff, including the minister, to support our programs, and to repair and maintain our campus. As members, 
we each pledge to support the operating budget. Using those pledges, the Finance Committee creates a budget. Your input will be heard at the budget workshop on October 26th. And the more we can pledge, the more we can live out our mission, which says, by serving compassionately and connecting authentically, we change the world. So Karen Kempf, Sue Real, and I have planned some fun ways for us to get this done. Sue, unfortunately, has a health, some health problems this morning. So Hope is going to help us in, in her place. So our aims for the next six weeks are, first of all, pledge. Karen is going to show us the, the we hope that you will fill out your form online. That's the easiest at uucj.org. But she does have some paper forms, and we will have them available in the breezeway after the service. Now, our operating expenses have increased with the inflation. We are aiming for 10% more than we pledged last year. And if you increase your pledge, you can enter the raffle. Hope is going to bring out the raffle jar. <laughs> <laughs> the, the prize has been donated $200 gift certificate for the FSCJ series and those are some on the, on the jar that tells you what's coming the drawing will be November 3rd and you do not need to be present to win but of course we'd love to have all of you here so next there's our, our goals now Karen is going to bring out our thermometers. First, we are aiming for 100% participation. That includes all of you who use EFTs. Remember, if you want to participate in the raffle, you must increase your EFT. So then our monetary goal is $250,000, and that is a 10% 10, 10 increase over last year. The Thermometers will tell you at a glance each week how we are progressing. So we're aiming for 100% participation and $250,000. And then there is more. <laughs> we have two boards coming up. Hope and Karen will each have one, and they will be on display each week. Oh, the other one first. <laughs> All of our current pledging members <laughs> and friends are listed on this board. So when your pledge has been received, your name will be moved to the other board. So we're going to know every week how many have done this. <laughs> Now, Karen and Sue and I have taken advantage and our names have been moved. By next week, check it out. We'll be out in the breezeway. So, let's make this the fastest campaign ever. So, we, <laughs> we will not let you forget. Well, they're going to put it out there. Okay, moving together, forward together, sharing our treasure. We'll see you in the breezeway. <laughs> so you probably wonder how I'm going to follow up on that one. Um, but, but I thought today I wanted to focus on um, the value of money. And um, then circle back with that and how it, it impacts us on our own church. So I start with what is the meaning of money in your life? How does money connect to your values, your inner spirit, your hopes, your dreams? When I grew up, with few exceptions, money was not discussed in my family. 
with five children, we never had a lot of money, and we all started working from a young age. We had paper routes, we worked on the nearby farms, and we did other jobs. And it developed a strong work, work ethic in all of us, because if we wanted something, we knew not to ask. <laughs> my dad always worked one or two jobs, and my mom only went to work when my dad got sick and had to take time off for an extended period of time. We were behind in the mortgage payments. I was young, so I didn't understand that. But we were at risk of losing the house. My dad had to go to our next door neighbor and ask him for a loan of $5,000, which was a lot of money. But our neighbor had the money. And he said, of course. But he also said to my dad, any time, and if you need more, you must let me know. We are happy to help. Happy to help, that's quite a beautiful phrase. Here's a family that sat with us in church every Sunday that wouldn't have known about the crisis if my dad hadn't said anything, but really saw an opportunity for them to live out their values of charity and love for their literal neighbor. My mom valued the work she did because it contributed to our household. As a phone operator, she split her shift so that she would work in the morning starting at 9 a.m. and then she would go back in at six or seven at night so she could see us off to school and be home to pick us up or drive us to practice or other activities. Money was not the driver, family was but she used that money to sustain her family. And later in life, her small pension from the phone company helped sustain my parents' retirement into their 90s. Financial stress is one of the leading causes of conflict in marriage and partnerships, often leading to divorce or separation. For many, the reality is there's not enough money to cover expenses. When Kelly and I were first married, we were on a very strict budget. We had $35 a week for food, and we made a list before heading out to the Jewels. This was in Chicago. We kept a calculator. You remember what those were? You got one on your phone. Uh, we kept a calculator with us, and we added up the cost and the items as we went along. Now, if something was on sale, but was not on the list, Kelly would tell me, it's not on the list. And so we would have to either get it or substitute something so that we would stay within our budget. Now you may find this funny, and it is to us now, but I remember when we had an existential crisis, shopping. The store brand chicken pot pies, you know the individual ones in the tins that used to throw in the oven, okay? Well, the store brand were four for a dollar. The Swanson's brand was three for a dollar. So we, of course, bought the store brand. Afterward, I told Kelly, we've got to go with the Swanson brand. She said, why? I said, because the store brand only has pie crust on the top. I said, I'm hungry 30 minutes after dinner, whereas the Swanson has the crust all around, and it will fill me up. <laughs> So our existential crisis of keeping Peter happy was fulfilled. Now, we all have our own stories of needing to be frugal. And for some of us, these stories are much more profound than mine. But often, it's our expectations that get in the way of our reality. The saying that we have everything we need is often true. When we don't know how we're going to pay for graduate school, when, when Kelly and I didn't know how we were going to pay for my graduate school, an angel friend of ours gave us a gift for two years to help to pay for school. And between that gift and our jobs and being frugal and creative, we didn't have to take any loans out. After graduate school, we had an opportunity to serve at an orphanage and trade school in Honduras. We had to raise our own money to go and we reached out in humility and gratitude to our family and friends, and we received everything we needed and more. 
When Kelly and I were in Honduras, after doing volunteer work, we started receiving a small salary. Now, when we were at Covenant House volunteering, we received $12 a week. We had room and board and everything else, so everything was taken care of. But it wasn't much to live on, right? So we had this small salary, but we were pretty much used to living frugally. So before long, we had saved up $5,000 in our savings account, which was a huge amount for us. At the very same time, this is the humor of God or the universe, Kelly's sister and her husband had their first child well, he was still in the engineering program at the University of Florida, and they were financially strapped, and he was considering leaving school. Without hesitation, we asked Kelly's dad to write a check for $5,000 out of our savings account and give it to them. They insisted that it be a loan. But a year later, we made it clear to them that it was a gift, and they could pay it forward if they wanted, which they have done. Believe me, a hundredfold. So when Kelly and I bought our house, which we still live in 34 years later, we made a commitment to purchase a home in which we could afford the mortgage if one of us lost our job. We didn't want the stress of what we heard about of being house poor, which meant you had a big house, but you couldn't do anything else because you were paying off a big mortgage. We wanted to have money to use for the other things that we valued. We wanted to live in the vicinity of Kelly's parents, and wonderfully, a house opened up just down the street. However, because we came back from Honduras recently and were still job hunting, we couldn't get approved for the mortgage. The house was owned by friends of Kelly's family, and they agreed only for us to rent the house until we could secure the mortgage. And initially, we had six months to do it. I was immediately stressed out. The anxiety that I had inherited from my mother, um, that gene, was very strong. And Kelly goes to me, well, what's the worst that could happen? And I said, well, we don't get jobs, we can't get the mortgage, and we have to move in with your mom and dad. <laughs> and she says, that's it? And I said, yes! <laughs> and she goes, it's not the end of the world. Well, you see, she knew that whatever was going to happen was going to be okay. And I needed to let go of my anxiety, and more importantly, my ego, to come to a peaceful attitude. And within six months, we were able to purchase the home. So my personal stories with money are shared equally here by everyone. You may have had angels in your life at critical moments. You may have been the angel for someone else. You may have needed an angel and ended up having to fend for yourself. I'm sure it made you stronger. Money, or the lack of it, can change our life direction. It does bring us to a different journey. It is our attitude that makes these changes in our journey powerful and positive events, or debilitating and negative events. It is our attitude. What does this have to do with our community, our own personal journeys of money? Well, pretty much everything. Because as Lois said, this is an extension of us. And she used the word home. And so in its extension of our values, money represents the bones, just like at home. The budget is the bones of the church. Without it, we cannot stand and function, as you can see <laughs> with my crutches. We need to have that support. Knowing your understanding of money is very important to understanding why and how you give your money away how you value your investment in things that are important to you. Are you afraid to give money? Afraid that you won't have enough money when you retire or later in life or even next week? These are realities that people face every day. There are four principles 
about money and giving that I would like us all to be aware of. First, being aware that what you learned about money is important. When I grew up, I didn't learn anything from my parents about money or saving or investing. They just made sure there was food on the table and that we were okay. But my mom and dad made a statement that said they were so happy as the five of us were leaving the house because they said, we're getting richer every year. <laughs> and so we got that sense of, you have to figure out what you're gonna do with money, be intentional. Those of us that had parents living during the depression or that lost their jobs during the 2008, 2009 recession, learn to be very frugal. And they pass that message along to us. Some people are gonna die with a boatload of money. But as the comic says, the Brinks truck doesn't follow you to the cemetery. Second, be proactive about how you want to see and value money and what it can do for you and others. Something I was told a long time ago when I was working on budgeting. If you wait until the end of the month after taking care of all your expenses, you will most likely never have the money you want to use to invest in the values you hold dear. Set that money aside at the beginning of the month. What you value is important. And the basic things that you need are important. But placing one above the other obviously gives one a little secondary shift. Third, be intentional and be disciplined about how you earn, how you save, how you invest, and how you contribute. Make yourself responsible for your actions. By using a budget, you'll know how much to invest in your values. The old adage, faith without works is meaningless, is true. If we are not intentional about actually putting our values, which includes putting our money into action, our values are meaningless. Fourth, do your giving in joy. There should never be guilt, remorse, pressure, or judgment. Now, I love this church, but we have one significant downside. Well, maybe two. We don't believe in hell, and we don't like guilt. How can you run a successful mission funding campaign without hell and guilt? I don't get it. I mean, you know. Growing up Catholic, I had both. It was wonderful. We had a good mission campaign every year. So what do we do as Unitarian Universalists? We give in joy, and we give with a social justice conscious. So I would say that our principles lead us to the values and the giving that we do. But whether you're giving to a charity, to the church, to a family member or a friend, or you're involved in a money-making investment, if you don't have an attitude of joy in your giving, think twice before you give. There is a saying that says, what you are now is what you have been. And what you will be is what you do now. How we give and why we give in this present moment is based on our past life journey and our vision for the future. We're at a crossroads here. What we dreamed about, as Lois said, what we've hoped for for some time is coming to fruition. We have a growing congregation, stability in our leadership, campus renewal that will give us the new social hall, the elevator and accessibility, and the other things that we need for ourselves and our congregation. We've again opened our doors to the community. We have our English as a second language classes here. We have our sewing classes here. And we're utilizing our support for our recent guests coming to America that are going to be part of our future. 
we reestablish our children's program. And we're going to strengthen our adult education program. And we continue to build on our just, loving, and accepting outreach. There are some of us who truly engage in sacrificial giving, and I want to recognize that. That means giving out of limited means, maybe Social Security, a small pension, or perhaps a younger member here that has college loans, car payments, and other bills. Many of us give out of our discretionary dollars, but in either case, Unitarian Universalists are intentional about giving and investing in the church and in the world with the values we hold dear. You know, and this has happened to me, some years I got lazy, and I would just say to the mission funding chair, just renew me at the same level, and life goes on. But right now, that's not the answer for me. At this crossroad, I know that I need to support the programs, the outreach, and our staff, to operate the church that I value as the beacon of justice, and honestly, a safe place for all of us, souls that are searching in a different way from many other mainline religions and congregations. So that's why I'm being intentional to better connect my finances with my value, and I'm gonna make a 10% increase in my pledge as the board has asked. If you consider this, it will make a difference so that we're living our means and we're not living in stress. So if you give $3,000 annually, a 10% increase will be 300. For 5,000, it will be 500. And for 1,000, it will be 100. I know, I work for a football team, so my math, I had to make sure I was correct. <laughs> That's why we went with 10%. Uh, but I will tell you, even a person on Social Security or a young member that, that increases her pledge by 10% on $250, that $25 story is as meaningful or more to me as any other gift. If your financial situation allows you to make a larger increase, you should do so, because I want you to share your abundance in joy. So, the success of our church depends on our own two hands, which includes our time, our treasure, and our talents. Today, I just reflected on our treasure. As the meditation reading said today, individually we cannot do everything, but we can each do something. And I know that as individuals, when we come together, we can do great things. So, after seeing the wonderful presentation, the UCJ players. Are you inspired by what you see around you? Are you joyful about being part of this community? I want us all to give an inspirational gift of joy, and if we do so, our church will thrive. We will have a better understanding of money as we give it away, because we're going to be intentional about how we invest. Thank you.